Good afternoon. Welcome to Wonderful Wednesdays, module two or step two of the PA waveforms, which of course we call the Swan Gans catheter. And what do those waveforms actually tell us? Really, really important when we're talking about that, to be aware of what the waveforms actually tell us when we have a pulmonary artery catheter. So um, my focus is truly on the PA catheter. Today, I'm not really discussing right atrial pressure or CVP, except in passing. And I also am not going to be discussing the wedge pressure. Both of those will be included next week and the next module looking at venous pressures, both RA and wedge pressure, and then really differentiating what happens when we have patients on positive pressure ventilation and how that affects the dynamics of what we evaluate with our PA catheter. So I'm going to do just a quick review of some of the things we talked about last week, but it will be relatively quick, uh, knowing that not everybody was with us last week, but we definitely need to move forward. So I'm just showing you a basic screen. This is of, of one of our patients. This is our Philips monitor. And you can see, of course, two leads of EKG, arterial pressure, PA pressure, central venous pressure, which looks a little bit unusual. And again, we'll talk more about that right atrial or central venous pressure next week, the pulse ox and tidal CO2 respiratory rate and other basic information. But our focus today is really looking at the pulmonary artery catheter. So really important to review when we talk about the PA catheter, we talk about what's available in today's world. We just remind ourselves that the PA catheter has multiple ports. There are uh, three fluid-filled ports and one air-filled port. So the proximal port, which is blue, and we'll just take a quick look at that. Oh, sorry. Okay, it'll come up in just a minute. The proximal port is on a channel, a line that is blue, that is used to measure central venous pressure or right atrial pressure, and it is connected to pressure tubing to a pressure bag of 300 millimeters of mercury with a level transducer, but you can also use that port if necessary to give meds and fluids. The distal port, which is the yellow channel, is the whole 100 centimeter length of the PA catheter, and it ends at the very far end of the catheter, and it is used to measure PA pressure continuously and intermittently to actually flow forward into an occlusion or wedge position in the pulmonary arterial. It is always connected to pressure tubing. And as far as nurses are concerned, we never, ever, ever give meds through here. The only time medication will be given through here is by typically by a cardiac interventionalist in order to uh, actually assist with dissolution of a uh, pulmonary embolism. And that is typically done in the cath lab, but the patient may come to the intensive care unit receiving something, um, a, a kinase, like a, a, a kinase, which is a fibrinolytic agent. So any variation of the kinase that we go, TPA, streptokinase, alteplase, whatever it is that your hospital is currently using, typically it won't be streptokinase. It will be more likely to be tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, or alteplase, which is another form. That's the only medication I've given through there. And it is never, ever, 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 ever administered by nurses. Nurses just connect to the pressure tubing. Pressure tubing is leveled at the transducer and attached to a 300 millimeter pressure bag. Okay. The white port down here, the white port is used for any infusion. It's a big admixture. It terminates in the right atria. So you've got a lot of volume in the right atria. That means you can give really uh, necrotic agents, very significant vaso activations here, but also to remember that in order for those agents to actually reach your systemic artery, they've got to go through the pulmonary arterial and pulmonary venous system to left heart and then out into systemic arteries. So you have a little delay in terms of action time. And you also should always consider what kind of effect it might have on the pulmonary vasculature. And then the balloon port, which is the red lumen with the white square. And again, we'll look at that in just a moment. And we intermittently fill that balloon with no less than 
typically no less than 1.25 cc's of air and no more than 1.5 cc's of air that floats the catheter forward so that we can actually see from the distal port looking forward into the pulmonary capillaries, the pulmonary veins, and ultimately the left atria. It also normally, if you're using a smart or an advanced PA catheter, you're gonna have three other connectors. They are not fluid connectors. All you're doing is connecting those to a cable. One of them is a blue card and that hooks into a white cable that measures the, the port is white, but the termination is a blue card that is then hooked into a handheld device or computer that is actually connected to your monitor. And that allows you to monitor continuous SVO2. And then there are two white large hubs, big circles that actually have electrical pinpoints inside. And those are your thermistors. We use that for continuous cardiac output. So really, really important. The only thing I'm gonna mention here is with an advanced pulmonary arterial catheter, you will continuously monitor mixed venous oxygen. We had a great talk yesterday on uh, SVO2 and the meaning of SVO2, what that really indicates to us. And the normal SVO2 is 60 to 80%. The average is around 70. And a patient who has a 5 or 10% increase or decrease from their initial average on a trend, that means it's sustained. So it's not just for a minute, it's sustained for many minutes. On a trend, that's considered very, very significant. And a significant decrease in SVO2 is typically related to an inability to deliver appropriate oxygen to the tissue, that's cardiac output, hemoglobin, and arterial sat or an increase in the demand of the tissue because the metabolic rate is high. So you might be having a fever, you're shivering, you're seizing, you're in pain, you have anxiety. That's all gonna increase your tissue metabolic rate. And that means you're gonna use more of the reservoir oxygen. And that's what SVO2 is. So really, really important for us to appreciate that. And in the newer advanced PA catheters, you also have a capability to actually evaluate via the uh, thermal filament of the catheter that, that uh, helps us to evaluate right ventricular ejection fraction. Now, that's not the left heart, that's the right heart. Right ventricular ejection fraction. Now, we all know what the normal left ventricular ejection fraction is. Everybody can say that 50 to 75% normal ejection fraction. What that means is 50 to 75% of the volume that fills the ventricle will be ejected out but the right ventricle has a much lower ejection fraction. And that's why the right ventricle tends to be very fluid dependent because the right ventricle ejects 40 to 60%. So if you are relying on right ventricular function for left ventricular filling and therefore left ventricular ejection, you always would like to pay attention if you can to right ventricular ejection fraction. So here at Grady, if we're using uh, advanced swans, the only advanced swan that we have actually enables us to look at right ventricular ejection fraction. You have to have a special cord that connects to your Phillips monitor and the monitor that we use uh, monitoring the PA catheter for us, that's called the hemisphere, but for you, it might be something different and that's all okay. I'm not here to talk about a product, but the ability to actually evaluate the right ventricular ejection fraction requires that you have an advanced swan with a thermistor that's indwelling. You're not injecting fluid. You're just continuously monitoring cardiac output and an EKG cable that slaves from your bedside monitor to your PA catheter monitor. That's the only way you're gonna be able to do that, but you're gonna get a very big bird's eye view on what's happening with the right ventricle when you can enable that. Okay, so this is our basic advanced PA catheter and you can see here are the two large white circles. These are your thermistors. These are connected to a, a temperature measure before this copper filament and after the copper filament and the copper filament just warms the blood intermittently. And that is and the time it takes for your blood temperature to return to normal is what projects your cardiac output. If you look at your fluid lumens, the blue one, the yellow one, and the white one, 
Remember the yellow one goes all the way to the distal tip of the PA catheter. And that is in an artery. It's the pulmonary artery. So you never give any medication through there. It's an artery, just like your systemic artery. You don't give medication through there. It is hooked to a transducer that is then connected to pressure tubing and fluid tubing. Um, and that pressure tubing goes from patient to transducer and the transducer to your uh, fluid bag, which is actually under a continuous positive pressure of 300 millimeters of mercury. You can hook your CVPRA lumen to continuous pressure, but you can also use that CVPRA lumen to give medication. And if you wanted to measure an injectable cardiac output, you could do that as well. And then that white lumen, which is your VIP or your proximal infusion port, uh, you can give medications through here. Remember that's mixing, that's admixing in the right atria, which is really beautiful because it's a big fluid mix. So you can use all kinds of necrotizing or very uh, caustic types of agents that you might be administering like norepinephrine or angiotensin II or neosinephrine can all be given through here. You can give them in other places as well, but you can give them through here and feel comfortable that you've got a good volume mix that then dissipates the necrotizing effect of those agents. And last but not least, remember that little red lumen with the white square comes to us with a syringe that locks at 1.5 cc's of air. Intermittently, you're inflating that. Uh, you're actually pushing that air into this red lumen that inflates your balloon. And when the balloon is inflated, that moves your catheter into the occlusion position, looking forward at capillary, venule, left atria, left ventricle. So that's really important for anybody who's worked with the PA catheter, read about it, maybe has a little trouble understanding this. This is the only catheter in, that in the history of man that transitions between an arterial view and a venous view. The arterial view is the pulmonary artery pressure and the venous view is what's called the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And so that, that balloon sails the catheter into a wedge position. So we're just gonna take a look. Uh, again, I showed this last week. It just, it's just such a helpful video to look at the PA catheter as we are inserting it. So as the catheter is inserted, once it reaches the right atria, your nurse will inflate the balloon and the catheter will be sailed by blood flow through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, from the right ventricle through the pulmonic valve up into the pulmonary artery. And you can see here that the waveform changes significantly and floating forward into the occlusion position where you once again see wedge pressure. So when the catheter is deflated, pulmonary artery, and when the balloon is inflated, wedge pressure, which is considered venous pressure. So you transition from arterial to venous visualization by the inflation of your balloon. So really important to review the normal values. Uh, I always find it very, very helpful to look at the RA pressure, which is normally and typically zero to eight millimeters of mercury. It can also be negative. It could be negative two or negative four. This is one place in the human body, not the only one, but a common one in the human body where you actually can measure negative pressure. That's so incredibly important. So we can look at negative pressure here in our central vein or our right atrial pressure. That's really important because that's telling you something significant, which is you have a compliant right heart without enough volume. Now, most of us are not able to chart negative pressure numbers or our, our EMRs don't allow that, but it is really important to recognize it's possible to have a negative pressure number on your RA trace. If your patient's on positive pressure ventilation, that's going to lift that number up a little bit. So four to 12 millimeters of mercury if your patient is on positive pressure mechanical ventilation, which by the way, is really the only kind of mechanical ventilation that we do. Okay. RV pressure, systole 15 to 30 over zero to eight. PA pressure, just about the same as RV systole 15 to 30 
It's the diastole that's different, typically six to 12 millimeters of mercury. And when you inflate your balloon and sail the catheter forward, so it occludes an arteriole, it's looking forward to the pulmonary vein, left atria, left ventricle. Then we call that the wedge pressure or the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, normally eight to 12. And again, if you're on mechanical ventilation, you're gonna shift that up by about four. So you're uh, really is often with those patients, you're going to shift the higher number, most particularly, is eight to about 15 or 16 wedge pressure when you're on positive pressure ventilation. Now, understanding those normal values is really important. It's also really important to capture how it looks as your catheter enters the right atria, moves into the right ventricle, moves up into the pulmonary artery, and that's what you're looking at here. This is right atrial pressure. Catheter sails through the tricuspid valve with very little guidance into the right ventricle, and then through the pulmonic valve with very little guidance into the pulmonary artery. Now, unfortunately, I don't have wedge pressure on this trace, and this trace has been with me a long time, so I can't go back and look at that on that patient. But what's really important for all of us to appreciate is that the PA catheter gives you two really important measures. On RV systole, what you're looking at is the overcoming of the arterial resistance. And that arterial resistance has to be overcome by right ventricular ejection. The amount of volume ejected by the right ventricle can be measured with a smart, a smart PA catheter as right ventricular ejection fraction, can also be measured with a smart PA catheter as the pulmonary artery stroke volume, or what we call the pulmonary artery pulse pressure, which is PA systole minus PA diastole. But what I want you to see here is that your right ventricle is bolusing blood, ejecting blood into the pulmonary artery, and that pulmonary artery quickly moves into smaller vessels, pulmonary arterioles, and then towards the pulmonary venules, and then ultimately filling your left atria and left ventricle. So what you're seeing here is the normal transition in that blood from being deoxygenated to being <laughs> to being reoxygenated, and that is really critically important. Again, not only are we going from artery to vein, but we are actually in the pulmonary artery looking at deoxygenated hemoglobin relatively, that's no, sorry, that's known as SVO2, and then reoxygenated as it reaches the left atria and left ventricle, and you're gonna measure that, of course, in the systemic artery. So SVO2 is reflecting the blood ejected by the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. And that is a mixture of all the venous blood of the patient mixed in the right atrium, mixed in the right ventricle and ejected into that pulmonary artery. Such a fantastic method. And then that blood passes at the capillary level, passes the gas units of the lung, the alveoli, oxygenation should take place. And now that blood becomes oxygenated, but we're gonna call it pulmonary venous blood because veins of course carry blood back to the heart. So now that is carrying the blood back to the left atria, left ventricle and will be ejected outwards. So I want you to appreciate that your right ventricle, which is over here, must actually elicit enough of a response to actually send blood through the pulmonary artery, through the pulmonary capillaries, through the pulmonary veins, and to the left atria and left ventricle. Now, this is a very low resistance compartment, typically, and it's quite easy for the right ventricle to engender the amount of work that needs to be done to do that unless something happens here to increase the resistance. And the most common resistance that needs to be overcome by your right ventricle is positive pressure ventilation, PEEP, or any other mean airway pressure strategy, prolonged die time ventilation, high frequency oscillation, anything of that nature has to be overcome by your right ventricle. So the real truth of the matter is you love a PA catheter because a PA catheter tells you 
about the right heart, and that's seen really in the PA systole, that's about your right heart and the integrity of the pulmonary artery. So PA catheter reflects the right heart in the pulmonary arterial pressure, which is very similar to the right ventricular pressure. You can see here, normally, physiologically, there's only a difference in three millimeters of mercury on either side and reflects the left heart in the PA diastole. So very important to appreciate. PA systole reflects the right heart and the right heart work. PA diastole reflects the left heart and the left heart filling. This is so incredibly important for us to appreciate and understand because we're getting two pieces of information for the price of that one catheter. PA systole reflects RV systole. PA diastole reflects LV diastole. Really, really important. And what we also want to appreciate is we also do a calculation that tells us about the resistance of the pulmonary vascular bed. Anything higher than 250 is now requiring the right ventricle, which does not actually have the capability, but it's requiring that the right ventricle works harder. So again, I just call to your attention that the systolic pressure of the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery in most situations is very similar, and that the diastolic pressure, sorry, of the pulmonary artery and the left ventricle are also very similar. So you're reflecting the right heart with PA systole and the left heart with PA diastole. Now, overall in the ICU, you really only plan to see right ventricular waveform, true right ventricular pressure, only with the insertion of your PA catheter. Now, sometimes your catheter uh, actually moves back out of the pulmonary artery and the tip ends up in the RV. Sometimes the catheter moves forward and the channel for the RA resides in the RV. But in the general rule of thumb, we only want to see RV pressure when our PA catheter is inserted. But by the way, very important to remember that you can see RV pressure with your PA catheter when there's something wrong with the placement of your catheter. Either the catheter has too much catheter inside the patient or the catheter has been pulled out of the pulmonary artery and the tip resides in the RV, which is why we have to appreciate and understand the waveforms. So again, just remember, RV systole in the normal situation is reflected in PA systole and it's measured at the peak. The electrical event that causes the mechanical response is the QRS. So if I did a dual channel recording, we're gonna take a look at a couple in a moment, a dual channel recording, I would draw a line down from my QRS and the big wave following that would be my PA systole. And that peak of pressure occurs after the QRS. Electrical event first, mechanical event second. RV diastole is reflected, of course, in the RA as CVP or RA pressure. Okay, so that's your CVP pressure. And what I didn't put here was the diastolic pressure, which we are gonna talk a lot about with your PA catheter. And in the RV, what we have is basically, if we're measuring RV pressure, we see the RV systole, we see the RV diastole, it's a rapid up to the systole and a rapid down to the diastole, and there is no valve that closes that separates the RV from the reading, because your catheter is in the RV, you see rapid up stroke to systole, rapid down for the diastole, and no dichrotic notch. That's really important because that aids us in evaluating our pressure. So this is a basic RV pressure wave. Now you can see here that you have some uh, alterations in electrical conduction, but each electrical conduction does uh, create a mechanical contraction. And this is your basic RV pressure. Rapid upstroke, rapid fall down, and then very important is this 
small plateau here. That small plateau is indicating how the volume moves from the atria of the ventricle passively and the end of diastole, which means the atria, if it's contracting, the atria contracts and it ultimately optimizes the filling of the right ventricle. So this number right here is the number we're most concerned with. That's called the end diastolic measure. So rapid upstroke, rapid fall down, plateaued end diastole, and then upstroke, fall down, plateaued end diastole. This one looks a little un, un, unusual because this is a different electrical activation and a different mechanical response. All right, so really, really important to appreciate RV waveform diastole. Diastole happens rapidly, and then you have that passive filling, blood just dropping from atria to ventricle in a really compliant chamber. So if my chamber is compliant, even when I put volume in it, the pressure is not going to be high. Now, if that pressure does start to become higher, and by the way, you're not looking at RV pressure, you're looking at CVP. But as CVP pressure goes up, what you're actually seeing is that you have probably lost your compliance of your right ventricle. Okay, so that very late diastole where number two is, this is what we call the active filling of the right ventricle that is correlated to atrial contraction, also called the hangout period or the hangout interval. And also, by the way, is actually at the end of diastole and is the most important period of time because this tells you about the response of the ventricle to the atrial contraction or the atrial kick. RV systole. Now remember what we talked about. You have this really quite a rapid upstroke. So your right ventricle is contracting, contracting, contracting. And at the peak here is when your pulmonic valve opens and you rapidly empty the right ventricle back down to that passive period. Isovolumetric, isovolumetric just means working against itself. Ventricle was electrically activated. That's why you look at the QRS. The ventricle starts to contract and it has to generate enough pressure to overcome the resistance of the pulmonary artery, open the pulmonic valve so that we can bolus blood forward into the pulmonary artery. And then of course, you have relaxation. So really, really important to appreciate that RV systole has to overcome pulmonary artery resistance. And that's why this is so incredibly important in terms of the way we look at our patients. So remember, I said before, typically you're only gonna see an RV waveform on insertion. That's what you're hoping for. We're not talking about the cath lab here. We're talking about an ICU with a PA catheter. So here's your QRS. And I love this one because I have a nice line here. I'm going to draw that line down and you can see the big wave following. This is your RV systole and the trend downwards. Here you might've had a dichrotic notch and your catheter might be going back and forth. So I'm going to move over here and say, okay, here's my electrical activation, QRS. I'm going to draw a line down and immediately following that, I have an RV systole and then a rapid fall down in pressure. And then I have kind of passive filling and then an active filling. And this is the end of diastole. End of diastole is before the next systole. Okay, so good. I drew a line for you to actually see that. And then to remind ourselves very, very importantly, that these are two really important components, systole and diastole, right? Systole and diastole. So when we're looking at that RV waveform, just like we looked at a moment ago, you see after the QRS, you have RV contraction, RV systole, and that is incredibly and profoundly important. And at the P wave, you have that active filling that occurs right about here. That's also called the hangout interval or the end diastole. Now you're hoping you're never gonna be looking at that RV pressure. What you do hope to see 
is PA pressure. And there's a lot of difference between the RV and the pulmonary artery. So here, I'm so sorry because I couldn't make it different colors. It was taken from a textbook. So you're looking here at RV pressure and you can see you rapidly go to upstroke and then you rapidly fall down, right? And here is what we call that hangout interval. And that's really, really important because the hangout interval in the RV is at the end of the plateau, but in the pulmonary artery, it's at the dichrotic notch. So that is very, very important. So this is just a basic phasic pulmonary arterial flow correlated to the QRS. Up we go, down we go, dichrotic notch and diastole. But now we wanna you know, put that on top of an RV pressure. RV pressure goes up and then it falls way down. Now remember, the reason diastolic pressure in the RV is really low is because the RV is relatively empty after ejection. Whereas the pulmonary artery has more tensile quality. It's a chamber that vasoconstricts and vasodilates. Your right ventricle only contracts and relaxes. On contraction, pressure is high. And on relaxin, relaxation, pressure is low. That's really different than an artery. The artery is responding, we'll go up here, is responding to the RV ejection. But the diastolic pressure in the pulmonary artery is profoundly different than the diastolic pressure of the RV because you've got a small chamber with a whole big bolus of blood that is moving through the artery, whereas the right ventricle has relatively emptied. And that's why this is so important. Okay, so PA waveform. Now this is a PA waveform. PA waveform is a right heart reflector. Now we're going to draw a line down just at, you know, somewhere in the QRS. You can draw it in the middle. You can draw it a little bit after. And what you're looking for is the big upstroke following that. And that's your systole. But by the way, you definitely, definitely have to consider following the P or at the end of the PR interval, looking for that uh, that diastolic drop, that's that hangout interval, and then up into the plateau. That plateau is the response to the atrial contraction. It just takes a little bit of time, and that's what you're seeing here. That's that's really 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 important. But between those two, you also have a dichrotic notch. So peak systole, dichrotic notch, diastole, and diastole. Systole, dichrotic notch, diastole, and diastole. Really, really important for us to appreciate. So first and foremost, PA systole reflects RV systole. So we're going to look over here to our left. We're looking at the RV systole. So I've drawn that line down to say, here's my upstroke. Here's my upstroke. And that's my RV systole. And you can see also that you fall straight down, no dichrotic notch, and you can see the plateau underneath there. Now, we generally are not going to be monitoring RV pressure. So we're going to look at the reflection of RV diastole in the CVP. When CVP goes up, that typically means that your RV has lost compliance. Okay, now if you start with the high CVP, you don't really know. But if you start with the lower CVP and now it's going up and up and up, that's usually an indicator that you've lost RV compliance. Now we look over here and we talk about PA systole. Okay, so again, PA systole, this is not the same patient, but PA systole is that systolic upstroke that occurs in the pulmonary artery correlated to when the RV is ejecting. And then you have a drop down in the pressure. Now the RV is no longer ejecting into the PA. So the PA pressure starts to drop, but then the pulmonic valve closes and that instills the dichrotic notch. And because you're in an artery, not a huge chamber like the ventricle, an artery, what you see is the diastolic pressure is significantly higher than the diastolic pressure you saw in the RV. And truthfully, 
will say, again, PA systole reflects RV ejection, PA diastole reflects LV filling. And in order for me to make that even more clear, PA systole is deoxygenated blood, PA diastole is reflecting the blood flow through the capillaries to oxygenate the blood and return it to the left atria and left ventricle. So just remember, on diastole, when we're talking about the heart, on diastole, your tricuspid and mitral valves are open. So you're looking at one big chamber. So in PA diastole, you are looking from pulmonary artery to pulmonary capillary to pulmonary vein to left atria, mitral valve open to the left ventricle. And so you might say, well, Barbara, lots of our patients don't have an open mitral valve. They have mitral stenosis. What does that mean? That means that because you don't have a big open chamber, your PA diastolic pressure is gonna be elevated because you've got a narrow lumen and that blood is not really moving effectively from atria down to ventricle. It's so straight forward. Don't let colors of chambers and worries about not knowing the PA catheter. Understand the physiology. Systole is when the ventricle contracts and it opens the semilunar valves, aortic and pulmonic. Diastole is when the mitral and tricuspid valves are open and the ventricle is filling. So PI, PA diastole actually reflects LV filling. PA systole reflects RV ejection. Whenever you have the opportunity to have a PA catheter, you've got to separate that data. PA systole reflects the right heart and the integrity of the pulmonary artery. PA diastole reflects the left heart and the integrity of LV filling. And that is so incredibly important. So also really important is to remember, and this is what most people talk about. I really don't like it, but it's what people use. So I'm using it here. That not only do you want to look at end diastole, but you always want to monitor patients during their expiratory cycle. So in general, that means the lowest pressures when your patient's on a ventilator or the highest pressures when your patient is breathing spontaneously. So taking a look at this, you can see here's your PA pressure, very stable, very stable, and then it drops, okay? And their CVP also, very stable, very stable, and then it drops. Now, if my patient was breathing spontaneously, I would always read these higher numbers. And in fact, that's what your monitor does. It reads those higher numbers. But if I told you this patient was on a prolonged high pressure, such as APRV or pressure control inverse, all of this is about their inspiratory cycle or their high pressure cycle. And this, these lower numbers, now become the measures that you actually have to look at because your monitor doesn't understand the difference in methodologies of ventilation. Your monitor is programmed to say, whatever is sustained for the longest period of time must be expiratory. Oh my gosh. So let me make sure you appreciate we're reading 53 over 23 with a mean pressure in the pulmonary artery of 34. But actually this patient's pulmonary pressure is around 30 over five. And their CVP, by the way, is about two. But the monitor doesn't understand that you're prolonging their positive pressure breathing, and it doesn't actually have the capability to differentiate that. It's a simple algorithm embedded in your monitor. Pressures that stay for the longest period of time and are the most recurrent are always going to be the pressures assumed to be exhalation pressures. So by the way, when you've got a patient on pressure control inverse or APRV or high PEEPs, you have to take that into your factor 
of how you're going to read your waveforms. Okay, so here you see your patient has a PA systole that's associated with that high time of 53, and their mean pulmonary artery pressure is 34, which means that your patient by this dynamic actually is considered to have pulmonary hypertension. Now we're gonna look at another patient here and you can see this is their PA pressure and it does appear to be PA pressure. We don't really have a good dichrotic notch, but the pressure is 53 over 32. And this patient, this is their exhalation pressure. They also have a lot of PEEP on board. So that's also affecting their pressure. But if you look down here at their CVP and what the monitor is saying, the monitor says, you told me this was CVP. So I'm gonna look at the top and I'm gonna look at the bottom and I'm gonna give you an average. But I want you to recognize CVP is never a pulsatile pressure. Indeed, the lumen for your right atria, so it's not dangerous, it's just the channel on your PA catheter is actually residing in the RV and you are actually monitoring RV pressure. Now, this was a patient maybe six or eight months ago. I got called by uh, the physician, Dr. Holder. He said, something's really wrong. I'm not really sure what it is. I came in the room. I said, oh, your catheter. So first of all, this visual is very kind of damped appearing. We had 300 millimeters of mercury in the pressure bag. There were no air bubbles. Everything was connected. It was leveled. But we don't have a dichrotic notch here. So, and, and the waveform just doesn't have the integrity that it might need to have for me to say, I am really happy with that PA pressure because that patient didn't have pulmonic stenosis. No reason for me not to see a dichrotic notch. And then I look down at this and I say, well, I think the right atrial lumen is residing in the RV. And so our wonderful APP uh, in our CVICU, Actually, we communicated and gently pulled back the catheter one centimeter at a time. Now, how did this happen, you say? Wasn't anybody watching? Of course they were. But when you put a PA catheter into a patient, it's typically because they've got either left heart failure or right heart failure. And as that patient improves, their catheter mobilizes. And with patients who have big right hearts, a lot of times we have to have a big loop of the PA catheter to actually ultimately get the tip of the PA catheter into the pulmonary artery. And as that patient is improving, the catheter moves farther into the pulmonary vasculature. And that also brings along the lumen that was supposed to be residing in the right atria. Now we're not sticking the endothelial wall. It's just an opening in the channel, but all your numbers are gonna be incorrect. So what we did was pull the catheter back and that actually achieved a much better visualization. And this is the same patient, but now with a change in their ventilatory support. But look at the difference in that patient in their PA pressure, their dichrotic notch. This is actually the what we call that, that hangout interval or the response to the left ventricle. Um, to the filling, which is called a retrograde atrial contraction wave right here. So you'll see this little wave a lot of times in sick patients. Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything is uh, abnormal. You're, it's just a high pressure change. So you're seeing here systole, dichrotic notch, diastole, a retrograde wave when the atria contracts at that time of active filling, and then RV systole, dichrotic notch, PA diastole, and the response, the reflection backwards of the pressure increase when the left atria contracts. And you can see now CVP looks so much better. Same patient, okay? Really an informative visualization. So we place PA catheters and look at the waveform to really help us look at RV ejection. PA systole is an RV reflector and LV filling. PA diastole, a reflector of LV filling. So RV ejection, LV filling. RV ejection, PA systole, LV filling, PA diastole, two for one. The dichrotic notch 
separates the visualization of ventricular ejection into the pulmonary artery and the runoff of blood through the artery after the pulmonic valve closes. And that dichrotic notch is really important to help us differentiate from an RV waveform. The diastolic pressure also helps us differentiate from an RV waveform. So again, with our catheter, we are going to see a wide variety of pressures. We're going to see RV as we place the catheter, PA pressure, and wedge pressure, which is a venous pressure. And this pressure looks just like right atrial pressure. It's just a little higher because the left ventricle is less compliant. It's a bigger muscle. So if I were to say, going to this visual, right atrial pressure normally with that positive pressure breathing, zero to eight. Pulmonary capillary wedge or pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure, normally six to 12. It's just a little bit higher, but both are venous. These are both venous. Right atria, pulmonary capillary wedge are both venous pressures. Pulmonary artery pressure is an arterial pressure and RV pressure is ventricular pressure. So with your PA catheter, especially on insertion, you get to look at three different pressures. Venous pressure first, ventricular pressure second, arterial pressure third, venous pressure fourth. Right atrial, venous, right ventricular, ventricular, PA pressure, arterial, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, venous. And you only see wedge pressure if your catheter floats forward when the balloon is inflated, or if you had a big loop in the RV, and as your patient gets better, the catheter actually migrates forward, and the catheter itself, without the balloon being inflated, the catheter actually is what we call stuck in wedge. Stuck in wedge means generally, does not mean that the nurse forgot to deflate the balloon. What stuck in wedge means is that as your patient's blood flow and dynamic changes, the catheter actually floats, is moved just by blood flow without the balloon even being inflated into a basic wedge position with the balloon that is deflated. Now, the number one reason that we don't use PA catheters is lots of studies that said, PA catheter use didn't change mortality, morbidity. Well, of course it doesn't. It's like a 12 lead EKG. You can perform an EKG, but if no one knows how to read it, it's not going to change mortality and morbidity. The same thing is true with the PA catheter. That's why we have to appreciate and understand the waveforms. I actually predict that uh, in my hospital, we've certainly seen a decline in PA catheter use, but we still use them to evaluate our patients effectively and aggressively. And I, I predict that you're going to see a rise in the use of the PA catheter. We need to be prepared. We need to understand the catheter. We need to understand what we're monitoring. We need to be able to separate our information categorically into what's important and how we're going to use that data. So we're just going to take a quick look at a couple of waveforms. So, you know, you can look at the strip and I didn't realize that it was embedded on there, but I'm going to ask you what wave this is. So here's my QRS. I draw a line down. I see that big wave up and then a fall down, a dichrotic notch, a fall to diastole. And this little wave right before systole, this is called, you want to impress people, you just say, oh, look, my PA trace has a retrograde A wave. And they say, what does that mean? That means a pressure increase when the left atria contracts to move blood into the pulmonary artery. So it's pretty straightforward. This is PA pressure, right? We've got systole. Our systole is around 45. Our diastole is around 16. And the dichrotic notch occurred at around 20. So I'm using this little scale over here just because the scale got cut off. So that's 0, uh, 20, 40, 60. Okay. And then what waveform is this? Again, says PA, and it's pretty obvious, right? I draw a line down from my QRS. I have this beautiful upstroke. Here, I don't have a retrograde A wave because my ventricle is 
uh, my, my left ventricle looks like is probably relatively okay. And we can see here we go, our PA systole is very high and our PA diastole is also relatively high at around 40. But this looks like a pulmonary hypertension wave. And that's because your PAS is high and your PAD is high. That looks like pulmonary hypertension. Now with pulmonary hypertension, I can't use PA diastole to reflect my wedge pressure. I actually have to inflate my balloon. And on this patient, when the balloon was inflated, his wedge pressure was 18. That's a huge difference between diastole and wedge. So what wave is this? PA. Systole is 60, diastole is 40, and diacrotic notch is at around 50. Now, quite honestly, you would not ever expect to see a right ventricular diastolic pressure at 40, you would be, your, your systemic veins would be so engorged, you would probably have popped your veins, popped your abdomen, you'd be, you'd have gained 100 kilograms in the ICU because if your RV diastolic pressure was that high, it would mean it was not compliant in any way. Okay, so now take a look at this one. And I've embedded the, uh, the scale here, the zero, eight, and actually, uh, it was actually 16, and then uh, 24. So drawing a line down from the QRS, you see that you have this nice substroke. Do you think you can just nod your head to yourself that you have a dichrotic notch, and you fall to a diastole, which is actually right around eight, or maybe a little bit less. So the thing that lets you know that this is pulmonary artery is because you do have this slur. It's not a complete notch, but you do have this differentiation. Remember, if this was RV, the upstroke might look the same, the peak might look the same, but you would not have that slur. You would just drop down and you would drop down typically to less than 15. Now, normally it's zero to eight, but if you have a non-compliant right ventricle, you might go up to 15. You might even go up to 18 in an RV pressure, but this is definitely a PA waveform. So really important to remember what the PA catheter tells us. We have direct measures. We have CVP. Oh, I'm a very bad speller. I'm so sorry. CVP, PA, both systole and diastole. By inflating the balloon, we get the wedge pressure, which reflects the blood flow from the pulmonary capillary to the vein, to the venule, to the vein, to the left atria and the left ventricle, and also mixed venous blood gas, SVO2, the optimal reading that tells me how much oxygen the total system has used because I've mixed all the blood. And I have very nice calculated data here, stroke volume, cardiac output, vascular resistance, oxygen delivery. And then remember, if you have a, a, an advanced PA catheter with an electrical cable that connects your mon your bedside monitor to your PA catheter monitor, you can look, and you have to have that special catheter, you can look at right heart ejection fraction, right ventricular and diastolic volume, and you can always calculate stroke work. So a PA catheter gives you a lot of information, but I want to make sure you look at this. CVP, PA, SVO2, stroke volume, which is right heart stroke volume, cardiac output, which is right heart cardiac output, PVR. Those are all right-sided measures. Why is that important? Because the PA catheter is, was, and always will be a right heart catheter. It reflects the left heart, the filling of the left heart. So it's basically wedge pressure is the CVP of the left heart. And PA diastole in the absence of pulmonary hypertension can be utilized to reflect the filling pressure of the left heart. But this catheter is, was, always will be a right heart catheter. So that's really the pearl. It's a right heart catheter. So when you are only focused on the left heart measures, PAD, PAOP, you're focusing on your left-sided, uh, your, uh, your cardiac output measured with the PA catheter. If that's what your focus is, you're going to miss this. When your PAS is down and your PAD is up and your PVR is up, you have right heart failure. 
And actually right heart failure is gonna be treated differently than left heart failure. The pearl of the PA catheter is it's a right heart catheter. It gives us right heart information and very, very important. The PA catheter tells you things you otherwise would never ever know. And that's why we talk about the PA catheter, even though many people say, oh, we don't do that anymore. We used arterial-based stroke volume. Fantastic, fantastic. Arterial-based stroke volume reflects left ventricular ejection into the systemic arteries. But a pulmonary artery catheter reflects right ventricular ejection into the pulmonary arteries. And by the way, in critical patients, they are often not the same. And that's why we look at waveforms. That's why we use a PA catheter. So this is the end of module two. And I'm so grateful that you've attended. I am now going to stop sharing and stop my recording.